You know, as a parent, I've been um, in some scary moments with, with my kids. And uh, I remember one time, a long time ago, I was still in seminary, Estelle, she got this fever, and it wasn't just a normal fever, it was pretty bad. Uh, she was actually hallucinating. I remember I was sitting by her bed, and I was just trying to comfort her, and she took the, my hands, and she was just looking into my hands really intently, as if there was something in my hands, but there was nothing in my hands. And it really gave me a scare. I was wondering what the heck was going on and what she was seeing. But uh, she, uh, of course, she got better from, from that fever. And there was another time uh, with, uh, with Seamus. We were skiing in Lake Tahoe one time. And Seamus is, is a pretty good uh, snowboarder. But uh, there was this one area at the bottom of the hill uh, that ran into uh, one of the lodges, one of the lodge buildings. And there was no fence around it, but there was some, you know, some orange netting up there you know, that really doesn't do much of anything. And he didn't really uh, see it, and sure enough, he ran right into the netting and then dropped into this eight-foot drop next to the building. He ran into the building, uh, fell, down that, fell down that drop, too. And that was a really, really scary moment. I, I rushed down there, and thank goodness he was, he was okay. But he, as you can imagine, he was pretty shook up. And then there was another time uh, with Lois as well. I was driving her to ballet, and she had her dinner with her, which was, a, which was a, like one of those thermoses of soup, and it was scalding hot soup. And you can imagine she tried to open up the, uh, the canteen, and uh, it slipped, and the soup, the scalding hot soup, fell on her lap. And sure enough, she had some uh, pretty severe burning uh, because of that. And that really freaked me out. I was so scared and concerned for her. And uh, I remember thinking at that time that I wish that I was experiencing uh, that scalding heat instead of, instead of her. So we, I, we really had some really scary times. And as a parent, I think we all uh, experienced that at some moment. Of course, I can look, up, look back on those uh, moments and with relief because everything turned out okay. Uh, God, praise God for that. Uh, but they were definitely, even thinking back on those things, there's, there's nothing to laugh at. You know, I can't even uh, think upon those things humorously. But I was looking at reading this passage, and for some reason I was drawn to that memory uh, of my children. Uh, what this passage it reminds me and shows us is that it, the eternal life that Jesus has come to give us, that's no laughing matter either. Uh, the eternal life that Jesus has come to give us is no laughing matter. Uh, now, if you've been following with the messages here in Canvas uh, for the last uh, several weeks or a month or whatever the case might be, you may have noticed that we're in the Gospels. We're in the Gospels a lot recently. Uh, and the question that every Gospel uh, poses has to do with the question of who Jesus is. Uh, and each Gospel uh, basically gives us the answer right up front, but each Gospel answers that question in its own kind of way. For example, the Gospel of Mark, it plainly and directly says in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, it tells us the answer in verse 1 in the Gospel of Mark. And then in, in the Gospel of John, it basically does the same thing. It tells us directly who Jesus is. It's not really simply, it's more theological in nature, uh, but it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What was God. Uh, the, uh, he was with God in the beginning. And the Gospel of Luke also tells us in the very beginning who Jesus is, and Luke does this by telling the story of the, of the miraculous birth of John the Baptist and even the more miraculous, immaculate conception uh, of Jesus Christ. And then Matthew, our gospel for today, it opens up with a genealogy of all things. I know how you guys just love genealogies in the Bible, right? It's so encouraging, right? But Matthew opens up with a genealogy. Uh, and this genealogy, it's significant because it frames the question of who Jesus is around the context of God's covenant that was articulated to uh, the, their forefather, Abraham. And then it takes it all the way up to Jesus, that covenant statement of God. And uh, the genealogy, it closes uh, with the following in chapter 1, verse 14 in the Gospel of Matthew. It says, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, verse 16. It says, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah. So who is Jesus? Jesus is the Messiah, they tell us, which is the Hebrew word for Christ, if you didn't know. And Jesus is the Son of God. And so, like I said, every gospel uh, tells us the answer to this question of who Jesus is. In a way, each gospel, it gives us the conclusion to the story of the gospel from the very start. And then each gospel, it, it continues to unfold uh, the story of how each of the eyewitnesses 
how each of the first eyewitnesses themselves came to that conclusion that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God. But obviously, you know, for those of us sitting here today, most of us are here on a Sunday morning listening to this message because you already believe the eyewitness testimony of the Gospels themselves. So you don't have to be convinced, most of you. I I don't take that for granted. Maybe there's some of you who don't believe yet. But for most of you, uh, you believe the eyewitness testimonies of the gospel that, Gospels that Jesus is uh, the Christ, the Messiah, and the Son of, Son of God. We know the answer to that question already. We don't have to be told. We know the conclusion. But here's the thing. The Gospels, they were not just written for people who do not believe. The Gospels, they were actually written for believers. The Gospels were written for believers, those who believe in the eyewitness testimony of of these writers here. And for the people who already believe the eyewitness testimony, the Gospels, they pose another question. We know the conclusion, but they pose another question for believers. And that question goes beyond who, who is Jesus. The question for believers is, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? In other words, what are the implications of knowing that Jesus is the Christ? the Son of God, for our lives. And that's what I want to unpack from our message today. And our passage today, it shows us, well, it answers that question of the implication of knowing who Jesus is uh, in three parts. And the first part is this, is that Jesus is our only hope. Jesus is our only, only hope. So in our passage, we see two very different people with two very different problems coming to Jesus for help. First, there's the synagogue ruler, this leader, and he has a daughter who has just died, according to the text here. And the other Gospels, they actually tell us that the girl had not died yet, but she was, she was dying. And Matthew here, basically, he just cuts right to the chase because the girl, she did, in fact, die. And the other Gospels, they also tell us that the synagogue leader's name, his name was Jairus, and the girl, his daughter, was 12 years old. But Matthew, he doesn't bother with any of those details. What was most relevant to Matthew was the fact that this man was a synagogue leader. And not just that he was a synagogue leader, but that this synagogue leader, he came to Jesus, bent down on his knees, knelt before Jesus, and asked for help. Now, this word for kneel in the text here is the same word that's used for worship, for worship. But whether he was actually performing an act of worship or not, we don't know. At the very least, what we do know is that him kneeling before Jesus like that, begging for help, was a supreme act of humility on his part. Because we have to keep in mind that the Jewish establishment back then, they had heard about Jesus already. He was starting to make some noise in the communities. And they had heard about him, but not in a good way. They were all thinking, as a matter of fact, that Jesus was a heretic. And they were coming to that conclusion very, very quickly. You ask them, who is Jesus to you? And they'd be like, Jesus is a heretic. And they still think that to this day. And, and to be fair, Jesus, he made it very easy for them to think that because he was constantly challenging the Jewish establishment. He was constantly tra- challenging their traditions. And he did this on purpose, and he did it purposefully so that he would go to the cross eventually. And so for the leader of uh, the Jewish establishment to come to Jesus like this and kneel before him to seek his help, and what does that tell us? Jairus, he must have been desperate. He must have been desperate, and indeed he was desperate because he knew that his daughter was as good as dead. You know, for a wealthy leader of a synagogue, he was an up upstanding pillar of the community. He probably had access to the best medical care that was available to him at that time. He must have used all those resources that he had at his disposal to try to help his daughter. So Jesus, Jesus must have been his last resort. His last resort. Jesus was his only hope. Jesus was his only hope. And then there's this woman She had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Now, unlike Jairus, just the fact that she was a woman in a patriarchal society tells us right away, immediately, that she had no power, no influence 
whatsoever in this society. And we don't get the sense that she was uh, wealthy in any way uh, at all either. So she was basically a nobody in this, in this society. Now the Gospel of Mark, it does tell us that she had gone from one doctor to another doctor, but even as she was doing that, looking for treatment, looking for a cure, uh, she just got worse and worse and worse. And also, unlike Jairus, like I said, she wasn't rich. She probably spent everything that she had looking for a cure. She was unknown. She was anonymous. She was marginalized. She was marginalized in this world. But here's the thing. Just as with Jairus, just as with Jairus, she too was desperate. She was desperate. And Jesus was also her last resort. She had been looking for 12 years. Jesus was her only hope too. Jesus was her only hope. Now, brothers and sisters, it really doesn't matter what it is that you're struggling with in your life. Not that we shouldn't care for one another and the struggles that we all go to and experience. We should. We most definitely should. You know, whenever I witness our church family rallying around to support and encourage those people, who are going through some difficult, difficult challenges and struggles. It's such a blessing to me, and I'm so thankful for the love of this community. And that's not just because our family has been the, has been the recipients of, of your love on many occasions. But it also makes me wonder about those people who don't have a church community. Where are they going to turn to for love, support, prayers, and encouragement in those times of need? Because if there's anyone who cares about us and the struggles that we all go through, it's Jesus Christ. And he cares for us more than we care for ourselves, if you don't know. And without being a part of a Christian body, a body of Christ, how then do we experience the love of Christ? I know what I was like before I became a part of the body of Christ. You know, I went to church and I got to experience the love of Jesus Christ and I wasn't even a believer just because I was a part of the body of Christ, but not really being a believer. And before that, before I even started going to church, I was looking for love in all the wrong places, as that song goes. And it really, really hurt me. It hurt my life. And honestly, I can still feel the pain of some of those, some of those uh, looking for love in all the wrong places in my life today. You know, it stays with you. It really does. For young guys... It stays with you. Be careful. Honestly, be careful. Jesus cares for us more than we care for ourselves. But anyway, it's in this context that I say it really doesn't matter what it is that you're struggling through. Because no matter what the struggle is that you are going through, and even if you don't have any struggles in your life, even if your life is completely hunky-dory. You guys know what that means? You guys, young guys know? Hunky-dory. That's an old, uh, that's an OG boomer term. <laughs> right? Hunky-dory means everything's great. Everything's fine. Even if everything's great in your life, Jesus needs to be your only hope. Jesus needs to be your only hope. And if he's not, please make him your only hope. Psalm 146.5 says this. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. I don't know what's going through your life right now. If your life has been anything like my life, there's some ups, there's some downs. But whatever it is, is Jesus your only hope right now in your life? Because if he's not, he really needs to be. And not our last resort. Jesus needs to be our only hope. Jesus needs to be our first resort always, our first resort, because Jesus Christ, he is our Lord, and he is our God. But what does Jesus need to be our hope for? Because when we're hoping for something, we're always hoping for something. And so the second thing is this. The second part of today's passage is that Jesus is our only hope for eternal life. 
So like I said, Matthew, he cuts right to the chase in his gospel, in the story. Jairus, he goes up to Jesus and asks for help because as he says in the text here, my daughter has just died. My daughter has just died. For Jairus, the curse of death is the problem that he is facing. Jairus' problem is death, not his own death, but the death of his daughter. And of course, if it was his own death that he was facing, that too would be a problem. But like I said, being a dad, being a father of daughters, I think I kind of understand, or even if you have sons, you understand uh, some of Jairus' heart when he runs to Jesus like this in desperation. Anyway, what stands out about Matthew's version of this story is that Jairus, he goes to Jesus because he says that his daughter is already dead. Right? He goes to Jesus saying, my daughter is already dead. Now, if you went to a doctor and said, hey, I need your help. My son is already dead. <laughs> What's he going to do? He's going to call the cops on you and maybe call the security because he thinks that you're some loony and he thinks that you should be institutionalized uh, somewhere. But what does Jesus do? When Jairus says, my daughter is already dead, he gets up and he goes with him to Jairus' house. And then when he gets to Jairus' house, his daughter is indeed, in fact, dead. And there are all these mourners uh, crying, wailing, weeping. He's, they call it like a noisy, noisy environment there because of all the mourning around the girl. Now, back then, uh, they would hire professional, professional mourners to do the mourning along with a the family there. And so Jairus, Jairus, with his means and with his influence in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the community there, you can imagine that there was a large group of mourners there. And he probably had the, the best mourners that money could buy, if you can imagine. So they were, leading the con they were leading the people, they were leading the congregation in the morning, and it was a, it was a wild, just loud, crazy, crazy scene. And that's what, that's what Jesus uh, was facing. And seeing this, I think any normal person, what would you do if you saw all these people just mourning with all their heart because of the death of a 12-year-old girl, a family's 12-year-old family's girl? I know what I'd be doing. I, I would be bawling. I, I don't know about you. I would be bawling. I think most normal people, they would just be bawling in that particular uh, situation. But that's not what Jesus did. Seeing this, seeing this, Jesus tells everyone to leave, and he says, the girl's not dead, but sleeping. <laughs> at which everybody laughs at him. They scoff at him, which they should. Don't you think? In a normal situation, that's exactly what we would do and that's kind of right. The response was perfectly reasonable. Not because what he said was funny, but they were laughing at him, thinking that he must be the biggest, most insensitive, cold-hearted fool to ever walk the face of this earth, to say that when there's a 12-year-old girl who had just died. Oh, she's not dead. Obviously, Jesus is not an insensitive, cold-hearted brute. And he's not a fool. The point that Matthew is making here is that death, death does not mean the same thing to us that it does to Jesus. Death means completely different things to us than it does to Jesus. What does death mean to us? Well, it's not much of an exaggeration to say that I think for most people, for most healthy people, death is the greatest fear that we have, isn't it? It's the greatest dread and greatest fear that we have. And it's so tragic and ironic because we will all have to face it one day. Sorry for being so morbid here on a Sunday morning. But you all know this, I think, in your heads at least. We fear death, and yet we will have to face it one day. We will all have to face it one day. And I wonder, the way that we mourn, every society mourns for their dead. And I wonder if the degree to which humans mourn for the dead really reflects how much we fear death, really. How much we fear it. But for Jesus, that's not what death is to him. 
Death is not something to fear for Jesus. And death is not even something to mourn for Jesus. What is death to Jesus? Death is the curse of sin that he came to overcome. That's what death is to Jesus. The curse of sin that he will overthrow. And you all know the story, right? God created Adam and Eve, filled them with his likeness, put breath into their lives, right? Put them in this perfect, perfect, beautiful world to fully, fully enjoy. And then he gave them this commission. He said, go fill the earth with my glory through God-fearing, God-honoring, God-worshipping, God-loving communities and families. That's the commission that God gave to humanity. But then Satan tricked them. Satan tricked Adam and Eve, right? He made them focus on the goodness of creation instead of focusing on the goodness of their relationship with the Creator. And so they disobeyed God. And when they disobeyed God, sin entered into the world. And along with the sin, all the bad stuff that happens in our lives, every disaster, every disease, every disappointment, every death, it's because of sin. Because of sin. But then God, God sent his one and only son to die on a cross to atone for all the sins of all of humanity across all all of time, your sins and my sins, past, present, and future, every single one, even the ones that you are committing now. Jesus hung on the cross to atone for all of those sins. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. And then God resurrected him from death to eternal life as a promise of the eternal life that we will receive through faith. For God so loved the world. God so loved you. God so loved me that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That verse needs to be so real in our lives, brothers and sisters. Right? You want to turn to your neighbor and say, God loves me. <laughs> now here's the hard part. Say, God loves you. <laughs> So Christ did this, and now one day we know that he will return, as we say in the Apostles' Creed. And for those who believe in him and follow him as Lord and Savior of our lives, we will be res resurrected to eternal life together with him. No more disasters. No more disease. No more disappointments. No more death. And what else? No more sin. Can you imagine? No more sin. This is God's promise to us. And so what is written in Scripture will come true. It will be fulfilled. It says this. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? I don't know why, but I love that verse, those verses. That's how Jesus thinks about death. Right? And so should we. So should we. Of course, if Jesus is our only hope for eternal life, we have to follow up with the last, last point here, is that Jesus is our only hope for life, period. So through faith, we follow Jesus as Savior and as Lord. And through faith, our eternal life, when does it begin? I tell you this all the time. Our eternal life, it begins right here and right now, right? We are all immortals. But who would want an eternal life if it was just like the life here on this earth? <laughs> How terrible would that be, right? A life, an eternal life forever, Filled with disease, 
disasters, disappointments, and maybe there won't be any death because we have eternal life now, right? But there will still be sin. How awful would that be to face an eternity filled with sin, right? Think about that for a second. <laughs> I face sin one day, and I'm like, Ugh! an eternity of sin. And so it's really funny, right? Uh, I, I've told you guys this before, but there's a company that will actually freeze people right before they die. Cryonics, it's called. They will freeze people right before they die. And why do they do this? Because they think that one day, scientists will discover a cure for death. And when that day comes, they can unfreeze them and then bring these people to life or whatever disease that they may be experiencing, even like old age. They think old age is a disease, right? And they do that to have eternal life, a life filled with disasters, diseases, disappointments, and sin. And who knows how many times they could go into that cryonic freezing state. I don't know. It's crazy to me. But what's funny about this, especially, is that we all have eternal souls already. We all have immortal souls already. We don't have to do anything to live forever. But what matters, though, is how we live that eternal life, how we live in the eternity. So this woman with this condition, this bleeding condition, she teaches us this lesson. And at first, the fact that she was suffering from this condition for 12 whole years sounds really, really horrific. None of us would want to suffer any kind of condition for 12 whole, whole years, even though those, those things happen. But if you think about it, like I've, I've had gout for maybe 20 years now. You know, I've learned to live with it. I've learned to manage it somehow. Just like this woman, for 12 whole years, she'd have, she had this condition. She had learned to live with it and manage it. Why? Because it was not a life-threatening situation. It was an inconvenience for her health, which is, I'm not saying that that's, we shouldn't, you know, be sympathetic and compassionate because of that. But it was not a life-threatening condition, and she had learned to live with it herself. And we shouldn't make light of her suffering or anybody's suffering. But here's the thing. Her condition wasn't her, her real problem. This bleeding that she was going through, that she was subject to, was not her real problem. The real problem is that she was cut off from her community of faith because of this condition. That was the problem. Right? Because if anyone touched, even just touched, anything that she had touched without that thing being purified first, that person would have become defiled too, according to the law. Right? And so you can imagine, anyone who knew that she had this condition, it was pretty much impossible for anybody to have a relationship with this person. Right? And for her, in good conscience, how could she enter into a relationship knowing that she would defile the other person just by the simplest things, right? But that wasn't the worst of it either. More seriously, she was cut off from participating in fellowship with God. Because she was not allowed to go into the temple for anything because of her condition. She was not allowed to go there to experience the joy of the annual festivals that come around. There's three of them. There was, there was Pentecost, no Pentecost, no tabernacles, no Passover. She was not allowed to go into the temple to just offer a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. She was not allowed to go into the temple to offer a sacrifice, to thank God, to praise God for anything. She was not allowed to go into the temple to pray. She was not allowed to go into the temple to praise God and sing like we did this morning. Now, if there's anyone here who's not a believer, you might think, what's the big deal? But if you're a believer, I hope you see how tragic this is. Not being able to worship God because if we have faith, faith must be expressed in praise or else it's not faith. Imagine not being able to do that. 
Imagine not being able to do that. This woman, she was not living out her eternal life in faith. She was not living out the fullness of life. This woman, she was not living. She was just existing, constantly being reminded of her broken self and the broken world that she exists in. She was just existing under the curse of sin, living without any hope. That's not living, folks. That's just waiting for death. But you know, like I said, death is not death. Death is just a doorway to eternal life or eternal hell. That's all that is. But Jesus said, he said this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come. Jesus has come that they may have life and life to the full. Maybe this woman heard Jesus say this. Maybe she did. And so she was, so she was like sneaking up behind Jesus. I love the, uh, the scene in The Chosen that depicts this, right? As she was kind of sneaking up behind Jesus, just trying to grab a hold of his garment, you know. There was a crowd of people around there, so you know that there was no avoiding touching people. So she was just hoping that no one would recognize that she was there or that nobody would recognize who she was, right? So she was up there sneaking up behind him. And then in verses 21 and 22 in our text today, it says this. She said to herself as she was doing this, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. But Jesus noticed her. He turned and saw her. And he says, take heart, daughter. Take heart, daughter. Your faith has healed you. Now, I don't like to critique any Bible translation, not even the King James. <laughs> But this is one of those passages where I wish that the NIV had been more literal, honestly. Because the word for healed here is literally saved. Literally saved. That's right. Saved as in Acts 16, when Paul, the apostle Paul, and his companions, they were in prison. right? And then the jailer comes up to him and says, Sirs, what must I do to inherit eternal life, to have eternal life. What must I do to be saved? That's the exact question that he asked them. And then they said this. They replied in verse 31, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. Brothers and sisters, faith in Jesus is what matters most in our lives. Faith in Jesus is the difference between healing and hopelessness. Faith in Jesus is the difference between the fullness of life and broken existence. Faith in Jesus, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ is the difference between salvation and wrath. Faith in Jesus is the difference between eternal life and eternal hell. Faith in Jesus is what saves us. Faith in Jesus is what heals us. Faith in Jesus it is what gives us life. And life to the full. And so brothers and sisters, if we have such faith, if we have this kind of faith, Jesus is telling us, just as he told this woman, take heart. No matter what you're going through in your life, take heart. And so let us live faithful lives. You know what faithful means? It means a life full of faith. That's what faithful means. Lives that are filled with faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified for the forgiveness of our sins. 
in Christ and Him resurrected for the hope of eternal life. Christ and Him returning so that we may live out our lives with the purpose that God has given to us from the very start of time. To fill this earth with the glory of God in Jesus' name through God-fearing, God-honoring, God-worshipping, God-loving families and communities, which is the church. And brothers and sisters, and I, I hope and pray that these are not just empty words to you because I say them all the time. I hope and pray that these are not empty words for you. And I hope and pray for you because you know God has called me here to love you guys as best as I can. I'm a sinner myself, but I try to love you as best as I can. The only way that I know how to do that really is by sharing the word of God with you as best as I can. But I hope and pray that through faith that Jesus is the only hope.